Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me here again. Hi. And uh, usually we start all our Dharma talks outside of the original Light Zen Temple with the mantra of the universe in its purity, Om Nam. Tonight we are not going to do that for one reason. We have already done this wonderful Kwan Sen Bosa or Kwan Sen Bosa to mantra by Hakuin Zenji. And it's been a great pleasure to chant that together with all of you. It reminded me of a retreat I had with the Shodo Harada Roshi in Hungary in 2009, when I first met this mantra. And, uh, you know, Hungarians are very fiery. They can be very enthusiastic. And 40 of us chanted this long, 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 just like now, you know, increasing strength, in increasing signal that never for a single moment do we become separate from the mind of Kwan Sen Bosal or Kwan Sen Bosatsu. And now I'd like to begin the topic of tonight's talk with something that is going around. So the Zen Circle is a wonderful teaching tool. My late teacher, Zen Master Sung San, designated five points on the circle. And as an introductory, I'd like to talk about that. The first is zero degrees. That's how most of us are. And also most of us remain for the rest of our lives. Usually at zero degrees there are only material questions and sensory questions in our lives and nothing deeper, nothing higher. At zero degrees we are right and everybody else is wrong. That's how we begin. We want to be happy, but the world doesn't grant that to us. Sometimes we are upset, sometimes we are energetic, and at zero degrees, we are not really aware of the nature of life and death, and we absolutely do not understand ourselves. But no one can stay at zero degrees. That's the good news. No one. Because we always ask questions. We human beings are a curious species, and we want to know about ourselves. We want to know about the world. We also want to know about the other human being and beings. When we ask our first real question, that's when we depart from zero. And we begin to learn. We begin to study, and that's why education and correct education is so important. If we're not educated, then our most basic questions on cause and effect are not answered. Neither inside, about our psyche, nor about this exoskeleton, the body, nor about the world, how it operates. And if we ask the right questions and get the right answers when we're young, we can get to the gate of the Dharma. And we can enter the Dharma and continue our studies. And I would say that anywhere between 85 to 90 degrees, these last five degrees are the transcendental studies. Beneath that, we are just dealing with the world, each other, and ourselves at various levels of intelligence. In the last five degrees, we begin to understand something deeper, simpler, clearer than before. Most of all, we begin to realize how such a small speck of dust we are as individuals on this earth we begin to understand what it means to live in a country of 330 million people. Or almost 8 billion human beings on this planet, which is a small speck of dust in the solar system, which is a small speck of dust in the Milky Way, which is a small speck of dust in the larger Virgo cloud or cluster that we cannot fathom with our imagination. Once we have reached that, we realize that as much as we would like to study more, it shoots us into infinity, infinite knowledge, infinite understanding. But still, we haven't experienced what we wanted. We have read the menu thoroughly, but we haven't ordered the food and we haven't tasted it. We read about Buddhahood, but we haven't walked on the path. So when you realize that understanding cannot help you and knowledge is insufficient, then you are at 91 degrees. And you begin to practice. You stop 
talking, you start walking. And the experience is our practice, especially in Zen, because we take out the symbols, we take away the systems. Uh, we don't need priests, we don't need a whole divine structure. It's okay if we have one, but we don't need that really. And we keep practicing and experiencing various states of mind. And if we do this right, then it leads us back to something pure, simple, and clear which has no name, no form, no life, no death, no coming, no going, no dualistic qualities at all. We give a bunch of names to it. I'll spare you from most of them. What I want to demonstrate is 180 degrees. The ultimate experience when you come back before thinking, <laughs> you and this universe become one. And we attain our true substance. We attain our true nature. It's like the water drop returns to the ocean and becomes the ocean, attains the ocean, and never wants to leave. That's why we keep practicing. It's not your knees that like Zen. <laughs> okay. This 180 degrees is not mysterious. It's beyond words and speech, but it's the ultimate experience where everything begins to make sense, where you actually go beyond your karma. And when you realize that all karma has the same substance, that means you can change all your karma. And suddenly, the basic laws of existence, impermanence, interdependence, and imperfection begin to work for you begin to be on your side. At zero degrees, they are the enemy. At 90 degrees, you know about them. You understand their function. At 180, you have totally transcended them. And from 181, they start to work for you. You start to transform your karma. You start to manage this avatar much better than before. And this transformation reaches its climax at 270 degrees, where you can turn anger into compassion in a nanosecond. You can turn enmity into friendship in a moment. You can change even the most basic habits that you thought were unalterable because you stop the identification at 180. Zero is completely identifying with everything. 90 degrees, you know about the option that you don't have to identify and you don't have to suffer and make others suffer. At 180, the identification completely stops and the individual self completely extinguishes itself. And then it reappears. It reappears in a different form. We call that the bodhisattva path. And on that path, you transform. You transform yourself, and by that, you transform the environment. And there's no other way, ladies and gentlemen. We have to begin with ourselves. We have to go through ourselves. A great yogi said, the only way out is in. So if you want to get rid of suffering and the cycle of meaningless lives and deaths, we have to look inside. And without understanding 90 degrees, attainment 180, transformation 270, we cannot walk the path. And you may ask, what is beyond 270 degrees? Well, even the relative self, 270 degrees, can return to selfishness or selflessness. It's our choice. You can use your clarity for yourself or just for your family, for your company, Especially here in the United States, you can see many clear-minded people who have these magical capabilities of making truckloads of money or getting to very high echelons of power, but they are still selfish. So at 270, you make a decision, not for me, for all beings. And then you walk on the bodhisattva path, bit by bit, step by step, and all your transformation is dedicated to save all beings from suffering. So you don't wake up for yourself. 
You wake up to help all beings. And this is a huge dedication, and it starts after the magic has been done at 270, and you return to 360, where things are just as simple as they used to be. But you have changed. You disappeared and reappeared. And uh, at 360, the path becomes complete. And if, if you think uh, you stop there, good, the good news is you don't. Because you take someone by his or her hand and show that person the way. Because they are interested. They ask you. Not because you want to. In that sense, the Zen circle is parallel to the 10 ox herding pictures. Except that those pictures, they designate more points. Here, we stick with just five. So, moment to moment, especially if you have a hard time, or inadvertently if you give someone else a hard time, you're going to ask yourself, right now, where am I? Where am I on the Zen circle? Am I just a stupid zero degree guy right now? Have I been just that blind? Has my ignorance been just so strong that I displayed greed and anger uselessly, just out of my habits? And at the same time, our teacher says, don't check yourself. Just do it. Just walk. Our progress is not linear. We are not robots. Sometimes we touch a little bit of 270. We begin to understand that we can change ourselves. But we don't have the attainment yet, so we need to practice. Go closer to 180. You become a little bit clearer than 90 degrees as you read the same Zen Kongan again. For the last 10 years, something changes and your intuition clicks. And then returning to an environment where people are supremely attached and they bombard you with wrong views, you can stay without any dualistic reaction, without any identification. So we actually touch upon certain points of the Zen circle all the time. And our progress is not linear, heuristic, if you want to put a label on it. So just now, where are we? Did we put ourselves again to the center of this magnificent Zen circle? The name for that is, I know. I know. So when you return this to don't know, this don't know is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And this helps. The good news is we are never alone on our path, but we have to make our own effort. Each one of us has our own backpack of karma, and we all have a chance to put it down, look into it, so that it doesn't just sweat on our backs, but we consciously load and unload the items from that backpack. And the right direction is always wake up and save all beings from suffering, especially from the suffering that we would inflict upon this world. If we have done just that, we're fine. How do you know that something's wrong? If it becomes more and more complicated, you're not going to the right direction. If you hit more and more insurmountable walls over years of practicing, and you're not becoming clearer inside, something's wrong. If you begin to understand yourself, but you become more and more lonely, something's wrong. So you can really see the value of the teacher, the teaching, and the student's group, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha in this context, because even the greatest ones, Buddha himself, had fellow practitioners, at least two very famous yogis who taught him, and later on, of course, the Sangha appeared. So if there's any questions that might help us walk on the path you know, together further, feel free to ask. Does the circle become a spiral? It can be, if you are very conscientious and you unite the linear and the circular. Yes, it can. And you can look back, but don't fall back. <laughs> Just go forward. Hmm. So this particularly resonates with me. I do some sailing and I love maps and charts. 
You too. And Wonderful. the way you frame this, it, um, it certainly presents a map or a chart, maybe even a GPS of sort. When you hit a block, when you hit the impediment, mm -hmm. that's, that's the bell that says something's wrong. If you hit it numerous times and it always looks the same, something's wrong. Something's wrong. And then the direction has to change and also the energy has to change. And uh, our GPS is the Heart Sutra. It's a fantastic teaching on non-identification. So if you want to transcend, then you are not this, 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 the whole shopping list that we want when we are born. And the energy is Kwan Bosal, or compassion. Why? It penetrates everything and everyone. Uh, we human beings are so predictable. So everybody wants love, compassion, welfare, connectedness, etc., etc. And compassion is the correct communication between us. So when you hit something really hard and you see your karma and you're bleeding, take one step back, stop the mind and look. In Korean, it's kan hua son, stop the mind and look. Because when you stop the mind from thinking, it becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. In Sanskrit, it's shamata vipassana, okay? That's where vipassana is from. It literally means insight, we know that. But the price we have to pay for it is shamata, which means stop the mind, stop the monkey. It shouldn't bounce from one palm tree to another, gathering all kinds of fruits. So when you hit your karma, take one step back, control your dualistic reactions, and when your mind is clear like space, clear like a mirror, you perceive, you have insight, you have seen something you haven't seen before. And then try from another angle, going beyond it. Relativity is wonderful, because without that, we couldn't change our karma. We couldn't have another angle. We couldn't establish a different view. We should be really stubborn and stupid to hit it always from the same angle, always with the same energy, always with the same view. That's why our traumas are teachers. If we want always total comfort and trauma-free life, we die very soon. And I'm not saying we should traumatize ourselves or others, but nature is not kind or cruel. We are, okay? That's why in Zen, Returning to nature is coded within the tradition. And then you can also take your karma very naturally. Where it comes from, what it feeds on, and where it goes, what it becomes, what it supports. And we can change the direction, we can change its function. We have tremendous power. Why? Because we created that in the first place. We created our karma, our habits, our identifications in the first place. But when we forget about that, then we become blind. That's ignorance or avidya. And when we return to our original state, original clarity, original non-dualistic mind, then we realize we reattain our creative capabilities, which, if you reverse it, it's cleansing clearing out that karma, releasing the energy and information from it, and then you can recreate something else. You can change yourself. You can change the way you live. You can change the way you speak, feel, act, and think. It's all possible. Every karma is impermanent, imperfect, and depends on some other karma slash interdependent. That's our great luck. If karma was absolute, we would be doomed. We would have a certain fate. We would be like robots on autopilot. The good news, we are not. But some of us, in fact, sometimes most of us, have a very hard time with choices. The choices we make moment to moment. And that's when direction, as you said, the GPS, it has to be really clear. 
Where do my choices lead me? Where do my choices lead others who depend on me? What's my direction? What kind of effect do I have on others? And that's our great responsibility. And without attaining our freedom, we cannot exercise this responsibility. See the two together. It's the two sides of the same coin. Without freedom, how could we be responsible? If we have responsibility, we have the freedom to it also. Karma is our wonderful teacher. It reminds us of who we truly are because it tells us who we are not. I'm just trying to understand some this idea of the five points. Um, also in Zen, we, we practice uh, certain rituals, certain exercises uh, to help us get there. Some of them are movements of the body, like sitting, meditating, posture, some are walking. What I wanted to know is, because I've had a discussion with someone, they said that Zen is a body practice. And really, that's it, well, interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. And I kind of like said, a workout, uh, like a workout. That's that very boring body. for a workout. You can you yeah, imagine yeah. 40 minutes sitting, not, not yeah. moving. Anyways, I, I, I just, uh, yeah, I, I want you to kind of explain the whole body mind connection and how this works into the, the circle. Look, Zen is good for the body and good for the mind. We can establish that otherwise you wouldn't be here. But primarily it's a mind practice and of course it uses the body as a vehicle. I think we owe a great deal of gratitude towards our Taoist forefathers because they taught us the Tantian or Tanden practice here. It's specific to Zen or Son or Chan. That's when you return the energy to the place and to the state where it is undifferentiated or non-dualistic. So it's pure electricity versus your television, microphone, microwave oven, all these usages, because this is mental differentiation on the higher chakras. And beneath the tandan or tanti, and there's physical differentiation, and that's how babies appear. The Tantian is the place and state of mind where this energy can actually be refueled. That's when we relieve all these upper centers from stress and overload and traffic jam. Read the Dhammapada. It's fantastic because it boils down to this, that you cannot fix thinking with thinking. You cannot fix emotions with emotions. You cannot fix speech with more speech, etc. So when you return to this Tantian practice, and all these just completely empty out, your mind becomes clear because you finally stop holding your karma like you're precious, okay? It's gone. So that's why it's a good body and mind practice together, okay? Let's leave it at that. I know you spend a lot of time in Korea. What's nunchi? Ah, nunchi. Nunchi is intuition. It's a sudden internal impulse which actually is correct at, right at that moment. Where does God and religion fit in Zen? Because there are a lot of people that I know practicing Zen that are also practicing a religion and believe in God okay. at the same time. The way I see their progress, because I wasn't raised religious, I was raised diagnostic. I had two medical doctor parents. <laughs> <laughs> and over the dinner table, you know, these Latin names and body parts and the sickness and everything, they were just flying as dessert, you know. My maternal uncle used to be an Adventist priest and he was really saved by God. Uh, in 1956, he was almost executed. And the night before the execution, he, he made a prayer. He said, God, if you exist and you rescue me, then I'll be your humble servant for the rest of my life. Next morning, his cell door opened, and uh, he was free to go. 
So I have both in the family, and what I can observe uh, is that uh, those who are flexible with their beliefs and they are not clinging to the words of the scripture but truly want to get as close to God as possible by, by prayer, correct behavior, keeping the rules, commandments, etc. Zen helps them clarify that. Helps the mind become one with God if they allow themselves to do that. Also, it helps them understand some parts of both Testaments, new and old. That would be hard just with thinking. So the deeper emotional intelligence and also the intuition that is neither emotional nor cognitive intelligence, that wakes up. Somewhere in the scriptures, it says, you should not have foreign gods before me. And it's not just about polytheism. It's about the images that people make and worship instead of God himself. And I should correct that because it's God oneself. I'm not sure it's a male. I'm also not sure it's a female. Maybe it's beyond male and female. To take away the ideas about God and really attain God instead of understanding just theology, Zen is a fantastic tool. There is this metaphor which I barely use these days because I think it has been overused that there are so many paths up to the mountaintop and on the mountaintop we meet and shake hands. It's true, but many of us believe that this is a very benevolent metaphor. And most human beings don't think like that. They think my path is correct and your path is not. And they don't want to get to the mountaintop. They're just happy where they are and tell people what's right or wrong. So instead of that, going beyond right and wrong and truly understand the difference between the God of the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and the God of the New Testament where Jesus talks about unconditional love and he uses three words for love. Eros, he barely uses it. It's not necessary. Filie, which is between just normal human beings, the brotherly or friendly loving kindness, and agape, which is the transcendental love, and that's only towards God. And Jesus most of the time uses filie, and sometimes agape, and barely eros. And when you really understand that, then you see that Really, Jesus talked about our true nature as human beings. And, of course, you can call it God in different cultures, various environments. I have several yogi and yogini friends, and we, we say, oh, we, oh, yeah, Shiva Shakti, wonderful. But when you return to the essence, then <coughs> this cuts off all thinking, and then the true colors of Shiva Shakti appear. So, in that substantial experience, I think Zen is a supremely useful tool if used in the right way. And for that, we need hybrids, those people who understand both. And they practice like Thomas Merton, and we have a bunch of monks you know, here in the US and also in Europe, and also lay people who practice both. They are very, very devout Christians, but they refuse to subscribe to dogmas and just be the robots of history. Awakening is not relegated to Buddhists alone. And that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for your question. There? The older I become, the more I try to be more present to feelings, emotions, and also understanding that we're not at the same level of comprehension. So there are things I have to work out, and lately, if I can speak my mind and my truth, I do, even if that brings consequences. But I also feel at this moment in my life that I am being connection with the spirit to get ready because I am going to be needed in the changes the world's going to be happening and having, and I come here to be with this wonderful group, just to be centered. 
Thank you for sharing, and please keep coming to this wonderful group to be centered. That's all I can say. Because everything else, I think you already understand. But what is the exact need of us? What is our correct function in this world at this moment? It's up to our clarity to perceive, not our opinion. Uh, be very careful with your internal mission statements. Instead, use your eyes, use your ears, use your clear perception. What is the problem? We can fix that. But sometimes our mission statements, if they are rooted in some ideas, uh, they are bound to fail. And they had better fail. If we have a problem, fix it. If we have no problem, don't fix it. For that, we have to be supremely honest with ourselves, not to kid ourselves or fool ourselves into things, into missions, into ideas that are not necessary. So we used to say, correct situation, correct relationship, correct function. So if you see the situation clearly, then you establish correct relationship, and then you act correctly, you function correctly. And if it's not correct because there's some disharmony, misunderstanding, suffering, frustration, whatever, then take one step back. Was the relationship correct? Mostly, it wasn't. And why? Because we didn't recognize the situation. We didn't know our place. We didn't see the other person's place. Now, Sung Sensei used to say, when somebody's hungry, give them food. Somebody's thirsty, give them drink. Why did he have to say that for 30 years? Because he saw that human beings give food to thirsty people and drink to hungry people all the time. And they are completely convinced that they are right. In fact, you say, I'm hungry. He said, no, 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 no. You're actually thirsty. <laughs> know it from me. You're not hungry. You're thirsty. And if not, I hate you. So this is the problem. So be very clear inside why you are here. And moment to moment, keep that direction that we wake up and save all beings from suffering. This is not too general. This is, in fact, very generous. Because if my thinking, my idea seems to be going the different direction, any kind of idea that we may entertain, it's very dangerous. You cannot know better than the universe. You cannot be smarter than the Dharma. You cannot overlook karma. And that's why human ideas are either the best or the worst, whether they come from ignorance or wisdom. And this is about all of us. See, see our youth. How you were thinking about yourself when you were 16, 26, 36, and so on and so forth. And after your midlife crisis, what became clear? that we will die. Midlife crisis means in your cells you attain death. We know we will die. That we have less ahead of us than behind our back. Okay? That's midlife crisis. So, at the beginning of your question you said, as I get older. That's how you began. Just getting older in the body is not a guarantee for anything. But as the mind becomes more mature, which may or may not come with aging, then we see these things. Thank you. Next question. So this is going to break a little bit the, the pattern, but what is your take on the coronavirus and how do we face it? With, what kind of wisdom can we apply to what's going on? The origin of the virus is human error. And what we can apply is lots of hand sanitizers. <laughs> and the rules of the epidemic, keep your distance, but don't break your life apart. Nothing special. Nature presented us with a new teacher. That's all. If we are clear, we don't panic. But most people confuse their own reactions to the function of cause and effect. The virus doesn't know that it's a virus. We do. We have to be honest with ourselves to know where patient zero was. Unnecessary reactions 
make the epidemic worse. In this case, clarity is essential, and fear is the worst of the, of the advisors. Could you say more about dealing with karma? What specific karma okay. would you like to deal with? <laughs> well, There's so many of them. Yeah, Stuff comes up. It does. Um, what I understood you to say is that when we find ourselves in the midst of, of some karmic situation, if we can uh, sit with it or look at it without attachment mm -hmm. and just uh, perceive. Uh, perceive, inquire into it without concepts, after a while, even the inquiry stops. Perception remains. Mm -hmm. And this perception is not something passive, like you know, looking at the floor after the dog you know, pooped on it, and you just perceive. No. It's uh, when you do this internal work, then this perception establishes a distance. Mm. By that distance, the attachment stops. First, the dualistic reaction stops because you stop thinking good or bad about yourself because at some point it really begins to hurt. So building another self-image on top of your own troubles is so unnecessary. Stop the dualistic reaction of the mind by this perception. Then the attachment stops. Then the identification stops. Then you realize that this karma doesn't exist by itself. It begins to disappear and only the perception itself remains. So the mirror stays, the object in the mirror disappears. We call that liberation by perception. That's why we keep it. And the dualistic reaction or the, uh, is the confusing, like this is me. This yeah, is, actually, you termed it very well. The dualistic reaction is me, and I am a bunch of dualistic reactions compressed together mm. with a label. Mm -hmm. So, yes, our identity is a bunch of dualistic habits with a label on it and an ID tag, that's all. And we can become free from that. Other questions? Please. So the conversation about karma really has had me for the last year. You're is, lucky. Only is, one year? You're a novice. Only because of the suffering. All right, good. <laughs> which has been good. So, is the ability to change karma hinging on recognizing what's not working and not doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result? Yeah, pretty much. But one more step is also necessary here, to see where karma comes from, even if it works. Because you said, when it's not working, and you repeat the whole thing again and again, expecting a different result. This is very good logic. But what we need to see, that even when karma works, it can be very much binding. And the better it works, the more we believe it, the more we identify with it. So even so, that you have good karma, because it causes you and others happiness, good work, good life, good car, good house, everything good, but you feel like crap. Why? Because something's not clear. Inside you're totally depressed. Because you don't know what this whole thing is for. You don't know your next step. You are actually afraid of death. But you have everything, materially speaking, even in human life. But in one moment of honesty inside, you look, everything that you have will be gone. Everyone you have, you will lose. Then what? We're talking about that depth. So karma is coming from action and result on four channels. Cognitive, emotional, verbal, and action. So what you say, what you think, what you feel, and what you do. These are the four major channels besides the senses of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. So we have action or event and a consequence. This is the root of the next layer of consequences, which in turn become the cause again of the next consequential layer. Okay? So cause and effect repeated, accumulated, and identified with, and carried as your soul. 
That's karma. And if you stop and look and you don't make more of it, then it starts to grow weaker and it starts to disappear. Because karma doesn't exist by itself. We make it, we maintain it, and we can also take it away. It's up to us. There's no habit that you couldn't change. Why? Because you made the, that habit in the first place. That's why. And you maintained it. And when you see that it's really killing you and others, then you can take that away if you so wish. Have you ever asked yourself why human beings are born into these terrible situations? Why? And the answer, one of the possible answers is that we are so thirsty for life that even if we have this terrible karma, we are born and we manifest it. In fact, the more terrible the karma is, the more people, the carriers, believe in it as themselves. And if you have better karma, if you have a little bit more insight, if you detach from it more, of course you can handle it better, but you don't identify with that anymore. Not so strongly. And this thirst for seeing again, hearing again, touching again, feeling again, talking again, acting again, it needs this toolbox. It needs this body of ours. It has to be human. It has to have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, so that the mind could reside in it. We need the toolbox. Otherwise, we can't act out our karma. We can't make more, maintain more, or take away more. And this thirst, tanha in Sanskrit, that's the drive in the cycle of life and death. So karma goes very, very deep. And it's our true teacher. On this earth, karma is a fantastic teacher. And then the law that governs this karma our karma is called the Dharma. All right? That's why understanding the Dharma in the first place is so important. It gives us basic user's manual to what this earth is and who we are. And then the rest comes. Understanding the Dharma is 90 degrees, and then the rest I have said in the intro. Is identifying with what is perceived as good karma automatically invoking the opposite. Not necessarily. People can be attached to their good karma and keep it good karma for a very long time. But the bondage becomes stronger. So some people are excellent with money. They go to the stock exchange, they buy and sell, they really understand these things. They can win for a long time. They can make exorbitant profits and they are still good people. But that karma is more and more binding. How do you know? The first sign of loss, there's this jitter in the first year, panic in the 10th year, and this danger of death in the 20th year because you got so much used to it. So good karma doesn't become bad karma necessarily. People are smart enough to keep it good, but the bondage is stronger. From a very early age, I had uh, dreams and feelings about previous lives. And I have a repetitive dream, which I feel it's a glimpse uh, of a future life. Is that possible to it look into possible, this? It is possible, but then What's you have more thinking? work to do. It doesn't make you a better or worse person than those who don't see these things. That's one, okay? Second, think of these as the rings of the tree. Every tree, especially under this climate, has two rings each year. A dark and the light, usually yellow and brown. And that's how our identities are layered upon one another in our subconscious, in our archetypal reality. And most of us don't see the layers. We just see what comes through the layers, the impulses, what some Freudians call the instincts. Instincts are not really useful as a concept to understand how the mind works, okay? Unseen karma is instinctual. When you perceive that karma and you start to rule it, it just becomes a habit or a characteristics of your conscious personality. The basic truth of the Diamond Sutra is very important for people like you who have insights into the past and the future of their own self. The Diamond Sutra says the mind 
which is divided into past, present and future, cannot attain awakening. So in order to go beyond all this, you have to give up the notion of a separate past, present and future. All of us. And that's why I'm saying you have more work to do. Because you see deeper into the past and further into the future. And to turn this teaching into a practical angle, I can say that this moment is the cauldron where all karmas of the past, present and future are born and die. So if you attain this moment, you have complete control of past, present and future. And if you lose this moment, you lose everything. You lose your clarity, you lose your insight, and your past, present, and future will eat you. How do you know that? People who get stuck in the past because they regressed too much, either by some method or by themselves, they cannot live in the present. They live among the shadows of their own past. Those who always go to the future, they're always worried about the future. They're always concerned about the future. They're happy about the future. They're sad about the future. They also cannot live right at this moment and they lose the perspective that right now we create that future. And right now is the result of everything from the past. There are some students of mine who do not believe in reincarnation. And they ask me, can I study with you like that? I said, yes, thank you. <laughs> and then, they ask me back, why do you say thank you when I don't believe in reincarnation? Because it gives less work to me. <laughs> I can teach you easier. If you believe in reincarnation, fantastic, wonderful. But that we have to deal with more karma, more lives, not one. This one is enough. This has everything. All the rings of the tree, right here, right now. And what's important is find the root. And that's why we say look inside. And you find the root. And the root of the tree is none of the rings. Remember that. So karma, good or bad, what do can you make bind. Of it? Bind. Yeah. Bind. And you talk about we all carry our karma knapsacks. Yes, we do. Backpacks. And it pays a time to take it out and unpack it and lay it out in front of us. Exactly. And if we're able to do this, this is really about liberation. Absolutely. Absolute freedom. Yes. So I think most of us may struggle with the notion of taking the backpack off. Yeah. And struggle yeah, we do. with opening it. Yes. And struggle with pulling these things out of it? Yeah. So could you talk they, a little bit about that? Yeah. First of all, the backpack's been on us so long that we believe it's our body. So when you kind of loosen it, it hurts. So we got so much used to the backpack being behind our sight. It's weight. It's feeling. Makes you feel warm. Makes you feel sweaty, etc. That we are unwilling to take it off. So the moment you realize this non-identification, that you're actually not your backpack, sometimes it's scary. We call that Zen sickness. The first moment of real awakening is that it shakes you to, to, the, to your core. It shakes you to your very core. It's not what you expect. It's not this, <gasps> wonderful. They say, oh my God. really? I thought like this? This was my view and now it's shattered, it's gone. So that means the backpack just came off completely. And then you see the content, that's the next big step and some of it really stinks and it smells bad. You see yourself from an angle that you have never seen before. And it's not guilt, guilt is easy. Correcting your mistakes, are, that's difficult. Identification with your karma prevents you from repenting. Attachment to the karma makes it impossible to correct it. And that's why it's so difficult to put it down, because if you really put it down, if you really establish a distance, if you really stop the identification and this liberation appears, right away responsibility appears. Right away. And we 
are so afraid of that. In our better moments, of course, yes, sure, wonderful. But when it's an ongoing process, and it's like you know, shaving yourself off layer by layer, who you think you are, but you are not, then it's, it's really something. But no pain, no gain. That's everywhere, okay? So when we become really serious, and that's why I'm saying that Zen is the adult version of spirituality, because there are no illusions, no uh, kind of special layers, no kind of purple clouds over you. It's really stop thinking who you are when you are not that. And then you instinctively just spontaneously put this backpack right before you and you are ready to see. There's a tremendous courage necessary. So three essential elements in Zen. Great courage, great question, great faith. And this faith is based on experience. The question is the internal question. And the courage is the readiness to see. So without these three essential elements, we cannot progress on the path. If we do not have the courage to see, we leave the backpack up. If we don't ask the right question, we don't open it. And faith is based on experience, and you believe, since you could take out one piece, it seems infinite bottomless and endless, but karma is finite because it's name and form, sensation, etc. So it's finite because it came into being. Only that which does not come into being is infinite. So if you can see it, if you can hear it, if you can taste, smell, touch and think it and feel it and say it and do it, it's finite. That's how the law of impermanence begins to work for you, not against you. And then the great faith is that one day, one moment, you can empty this out. So I've taken the Bodhisattva vows. Once and both out. Great job. But I'm quite sure I'm not at 270 degrees. Can you offer some advice? Actually, I ask you a question instead of advice, and please be prepared to answer. What is love? all of us, then you are pretty close to 270 degrees. Do not underestimate yourself. Love is the greatest changer because it heats us up. It melts the crust of the ego. And when we first fall in love, in our teens usually, we feel that there's something, wow! And it's far from just a hormone rush. It's way more. The soul melts and fuses with another one, and your happiness becomes more important than mine. That's the process. So when you say it's all of us, then it means we have love and compassion for all beings. And that transforms us profoundly. Not bad, keep going. <laughs> other questions? I have a lot of karma in my backpack. I like to blame my parents. And I like to blame the school I went to. Freud says hello, and then? It's hard not to. Yeah, try not to. Try not to. Try not to, I... and I give you some help. Have you ever asked yourself why you were born into a certain situation or a certain family? Probably not, no. because we had all the external explanations. If you look at your choices this lifetime, when you choose your friends, your work, your place to live, the car you drive. This depends on the mind. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible that the way you were born also depended on the mind when you took the body? Even the DNA that is mixed from father and mother depends on your mind. That's why siblings' karma is so different. It was your choice to be born there. And that depends on your previous karma. So your environment enabled that, and through nature and nurture, education and understanding, family and school, whatever, activated you, and took things away and gave things to you. You made it. We all did. In our temple rules, there are poems, not just do's and don'ts. And we have a great Zen master from the Tang Dynasty called Pai Chang. He said, 
If you die tomorrow, what kind of body will you get? Isn't this question of the utmost importance? Clouds float up to the heavens, water goes down to the sea. Okay. Earlier you mentioned the root is not the rings. Yes. Could you expound on that, please? Yeah. I use another metaphor to give a different angle to it. If you look at your self-image, what you thought about yourself at various points in life, some parts are identical, some parts are radically different. That's over time. But even today, you played different roles. Maybe the worker, the boss, the father, the husband, the driver, the helper, you know, we play these roles for a shorter or longer time every day, every week, every month, every year. Now put all of these roles onto a stage. Role one, role two, three, four, five. Just count. Just today, how many kinds of roles have you taken? Where is the director? The director is never on the stage. The director doesn't have a body or a name. It doesn't even have an empty chair. So that's why the root is never the ring, but that's where it comes from. All the rings come from the same root. One director directs all the roles. So it's only your perception, only your clarity, only your mind, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror, that's the only thing that didn't change. But all the roles, everything you have said, did, thought, and felt, they change. That's why the director is never on stage, and the root of the tree is never one of the rings. But that's where all this comes from. Okay? Good. Forgive me if the question is silly. I'm completely new to this. I love silly questions. Okay. So... It's about intuition, you talked about a little bit. And many times I have an intuitive feeling, but only right after the decision already was made and cannot be changed. Kind of like when you have a white blouse and simultaneously when the coffee is dropping on it, you know that you're gonna, oh, I'm gonna drop coffee on it and I knew it, but you can't change it anymore. So I can that uh, intuition be developed so it helps you making better decisions? I have good news and bad news. Which or, one first? <laughs> <laughs> or, or is it worth it at all? Bad news first, because that's the times that we are living right now. That wasn't intuition. It was your very quick and intelligent thinking as a reaction. Very spontaneous, without any forethought. And since it was not part of a train of thought, but it was sparked by an event, let's say the coffee spill on your blouse, it seemed to be intuitive. But as I've said briefly, our cognitive intelligence, which you have experienced, our emotional intelligence, they're not the same as your intuition. How do you know that it's intuitive? There's a bunch of kind of check marks. Truly, there is no thinking before or after. It comes as a single impulse. But it comes exactly at the moment to the surface of your consciousness, unimpeded, unhindered, when it's necessary. Not after, not before. So synchronicity is a very good hallmark for this. Okay? That's the good news. So when it's totally synchronous with events, not before, not after. That's why Zen emphasizes the moment. All right? And we can develop that. How? By no thinking. So Zen mind is don't know mind. Not thinking mind. Before thinking mind. Then this don't know reaches critical mass. Then it becomes qualitatively different. It's not the lack of information. It never was. It's not just the absence of thinking. It turns into this clear-like space, clear-like mirror mind, 
which is completely undivided, non-dualistic and perceives everything right here, right now. That's the source of intuition. Intuition is the function of our true nature, directly, without anything or anyone involved, all right? But it refers to everything and everyone. It doesn't rule out anything and anyone. Okay. So since it's just pure space manifesting, it has no thinking before or after. It doesn't even have a person in it. The fact that it comes through you, that's your karma. But I can tell you that real intuition is really mind to mind. When you think with someone else about the same issue in the same way at the same time without talking. Now that's real. Because it's not just through you. That space has no boundaries. If you're not attached to your karma, it really has no boundaries. Then we share that mind. And that's why in Zen we have the four principles. And the fourth is transmission from mind to mind. And just as not to leave you with something incomplete tonight, let me finish with the four principles of Zen, which is not depending on the scriptures. Because if you're dependent, you become a good sutra master, but not a Zen master. Directly pointing to human mind. I've mentioned tonight that no priests, no systems, no intellectualization, no symbolism, nothing but this. Okay? And awakening means attain our true self, our true nature. Okay? Nothing else. Nothing special. But this is big enough. And then the fourth is transmission from mind to mind, which is not between teacher and student alone. When you sit with someone, a whole session, we have various lengths and you guys too. Okay? We have a weekend and 10 days. We have O session, this and that. We have 90 days also. My first 90-day retreat was the real life changer for me because I wanted this life at this quality which the retreat provided. That you knew someone sitting next to you like your brother and your sister or better. Okay? So sitting together with a whole group mostly in silence for 90 days from the outside it's not so significant but what happens inside and between us in that clarity, in that space which is our true nature that's awesome. It's beyond any description. Intuition is a process where you distinguish very carefully between your thinking, especially your impulsive and very clever thinking, or your very sensitive and quick emotional responses versus the direct function of your true self right at this moment shared with others, shared with at least another being. That's why sometimes animals are so good teachers. Because they really have no cognition like we do, but they have these blips of emotional intelligence or sometimes these intuitive synchronicities. You feel bad and your dog comes and looks at you and cuddles up to you, you know, this kind of stuff. How did that happen? Okay, you didn't even talk. You didn't have any visible reaction, none, and the dog feels you. Well, we can do that among ourselves, between each other as human beings, but we are more complex. We have more in our backpacks. We can put it down, we can become clear and truly connect to each other. So I wish that from time to time we could meet again, share the Dharma again, and walk on the path to wake up and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much for tonight.